Okay, let's talk a little bit about contrast agents so that we know how to safely handle these things. Um, so we talk, we've we spent some time already in this classroom talking about um, hazards related to radiation exposure, right? Ways to prevent harm to the patient, ways to prevent harms to ourselves. Chances are no one in this room is gonna kill someone by taking a bad x-ray, right? It would have to be a really bad x-ray, like a terribly bad, like catastrophic, like nuclear bomb went off in my x-ray tube somehow, x-ray. Um, so I, I, the chances are like one in a hundred million that that could happen. But the chances are pretty high that you could kill someone with contrast agents, right? So that's why we're talking about it now. That's why we'll revisit again. It's a, it's a central concept and it is something that you need to know about. There's a weightiness to it. So here's the learning objectives I've identified. We're going to define contrast and explain its purpose in medical imaging. Why do we use it? We'll differentiate between positive and negative contrast media, which is which and which is what. Um, we'll talk about the impact of osmolality on IV contrast administration. That has a pharmacodynamic response within the patient's body. Um, we'll talk about viscosity, right, which is like the friction of fluids. We'll talk about ionic versus non-ionic IV contrast. We'll talk about dosage considerations for both IV and oral contrast. Talk about uh, adverse reactions to IV contrast, that's where people die, um, as well as if you injected a massive air bubble into them, they would also die, so that's another thing to avoid. But discuss considerations for oral contrast administration, then finally we'll talk about gaseous contrast administration. That's what, we're, that's what I'm up to. All right, this is a really creepy picture of the Teletubbies just in black and white, right? It looks like something out of a horror film. It is literally just the Teletubbies in black and white. Um, so what contrast does is just that. It took the Teletubbies and it made it enhanced, right? So the Teletubbies originally were what I would call low subject contrast. They're all these pastel colors and cute baby faces and stuff. Um, I want to know where the baby face ends and where the furry purple part begins, right? So you inject contrast into the Teletubby and you're going to enhance the subject contrast where there's low sub subject contrast areas, right? So that is the purpose of contrast administration. Because especially if we're looking at structures like the abdomen, there's a whole bunch of guts and weird stuff all on top of each other inside of the abdomen. And I can look at it all day long on an x-ray and I can't tell what's what. Why? Because it has a low subject contrast. I can't tell the difference between a liver and a spleen, or where the liver ends and where a muscle begins, right? So we inject contrast in there and all of a sudden the liver is gonna light up like a light bulb right? That low contrast subject is now going to be high contrast, just like what's happening with these creepy Teletubbies. In terms of general classification, we have positive contrast. Oh, and just a terminology here, I added this in here. Radio opaque and radio lucent. Those are really fancy terms that sometimes we use. Um, and what they are talking about is, if I'm looking at this Teletubby picture down here, I'm imagining this is somehow an x-ray of a Teletubby. The radio opaque thing, the thing that the x-rays couldn't get through, right? Radio opaque means the stuff the x-rays couldn't get through. It will show up as white, right? It will show up as white. Radio opaque. Positive contrast. Exactly. If it is radio lucent, right, the x-rays got straight through it. Right? Now that seems reverse from normal thinking, right? So that's why I'm stressing that terminology. Radio opaque stuff. Um, okay. Radiolucent means that the x-rays were able to get straight through the thing. So strangely enough, we're saying it's radiolucent, it's going to show up as black on the image. The x-rays got straight through it. We didn't see anything. Lungs, for example, are radiolucent, right? The x-rays got straight through them. So in the Teletubby world, and this doesn't really work very well, but their bodies are radiolucent, which makes them that much more creepy if you think about it, right? But they're basically like evil demons, I guess. I don't know. I'm just theorizing. We've gotten into uh, theology now. But the important thing here is to know the differentiation between positive and negative contrast. So positive stuff, the stuff that's going to stop a lot of x-rays, 
It's the same thing as what's happening inside the patient body. It's going to cause a lot of photoelectric response. That's stuff that has a high atomic number. So we use iodine contrast, we use barium. Why? They have high atomic numbers. Why is that important? They stop a lot of x-rays. So they're radio opaque. They're going to show up as white on the image. So we'll call them positive contrast. They absorb more x-rays. Negative contrast is the exact opposite. It's stuff that either has a very low density or low atomic number, right? And so it does, it's radiolucent. The x-rays pass right through it. It's going to show up as dark on the image. We'll call that negative contrast if it shows up as dark on the image. Um, now, I think that's enough to say it at this time. There's more there, but we'll leave it for that. Okay, so in terms of different types of contrast media, I generally use the term LOCM. And when I'm talking about IV contrast, I'm always talking about LOCM. What does LOCM mean? It means low osmolality contrast media. 99.9% .9 of what we use for IV injections is LOCM, so we just call it contrast, IV contrast. Low osmolality contrast media. In the past, we had to differentiate between the two, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Other positive forms of contrast, barium sulfate. Barium sulfate is a positive form of contrast. It's going to show up as white on the image. Water-soluble contrast, iodinated contrast. We'll talk about that here in a second. It is different from water. Water is considered a negative contrast. It's really kind of more like a neutral contrast, but we'll call it negative. Right? And then finally, the most common negative contrasts are air, carbon dioxide. The most common, this is a tricky question that sometimes they like to ask on the registry, what is the most common form of contrast used? Air. The answer is air. Why? Take in a deep breath, hold it. Why did I ask the patient to take in a deep breath and hold it? I just filled up their lungs with a completely free negative contrast agent. Right? So this is the most common form of contrast used. It's free, it's out there all around us, we breathe it every, every day. Don't think about it as a contrast agent. But that's precisely what it's doing. Now in terms of IV contrast, so I'm switching gears now, and we're going to get really nitty gritty on LOCM, on low osmolality contrast media, because it is the one that is the most persnickety, it's the one that's the most likely to cause a problem for you, it's the one that make, makes me sit on pins and needles whenever I'm injecting it in people. So it seems like the most important one, right? So low osmolality, what the heck are we talking about when we talk about osmolality and whether it's low or it's high? Osmolality refers to the number of particles in solution per unit, and that can be as compared to blood, right? So that's probably on your quiz somewhere, right? Because it's important because that's part of what kills people, right? You might be wondering, how does it kill people? Well, wait with me for just a sec. We measure it in milliosmoles per kilogram. I'm really not interested in that, but blood plasma, for example, is 290 milliosmoles per kilogram. We want contrast that's roughly the same osmolality as blood. This has the same number of particles roughly as blood, right? That's what osmolality means. So what's this HOCM versus, well, you can probably guess if, low, if LOCM is low osmolality, HOCM is high osmolality contrast media. And when we first were sitting around and vitting contrast medias, all we could figure out was these high osmolality contrast medias. And they kill people, right? Much more prevalently than, than the LOCM. Why is that? High osmolality is up to seven times as osmolar as blood. So if you can imagine, we're, we're injecting a whole lot of something that's a heavy amount of high atomic number particles into someone's body that is bound to cause some kind of response for quite a few members of our population, right? So the original contrast, that things that were developed at different, I won't name names, but, but early contrast medias that were used did have a high incidence of contrast reaction, did have a high incidence of fatality associated with them relative to what we're using now. Now we use low osmolality contrast media and we'll define that as stuff that's roughly twice the osmolality of blood roughly twice the osmolality of blood. We'll call that an LOCM. And it's going to have a reduced number of reactions. So the number one thing that we can do to prevent contrast reactions is use an LOCM, which is what we're all doing anyways. Right? All right, well, let's talk about why it's killing people. Um, I think a lot about the probably the greatest rock ballad of all time, which was Queen um, hooking up with David Bowie 
and singing the song Under Pressure, which later on Vanilla Ice stole the beat from, right? It's an amazing song. If you've never heard it, go out and listen to it. It'll make you cry your eyes out. Um, but the reason I've got it up here is because what we're dealing with when we talk about the pharmacodynamics of osmolality, right, is using this fancy language, let's go back to the Queen song. What is killing people in the Queen song? There's too much pressure, right? There's too much pressure, the people are under pressure, and it's making them scream stuff like, let me out of here, right? That the exact same thing is happening anytime we inject contrast media into people's veins, right? There's, osmo there's osmolar gates within every cell of your body that regulates whether there's water in the cell or water outside the cell. It's all about water, right? So. Um, water tends to pass through the membranes in the direction of highest particle concentration. That's a really good thing, right? That's a good thing that's part of how your insides stay inside you, right? Um, versus leaking out of you constantly. So the membranes allow water to move into areas where there's a high, high osmolality. So if I inject something that has high osmolality into your veins, all the water gets sucked out of the cells. It's sucked out of the blood cells. Now I just jacked with your blood pressure, right? I just jacked with your amount of circulation that your heart's having to beat stuff through, right? The amount of movement that the heart's having to do. Um, I've messed with the total blood volume, if you will, because I've moved the water that was in the blood cells out into the bloodstream, and it's increased all of those things. So it increased the pressure, right? So if you want a really simple way to think about this, what are the pharmacodynamics of contrast media injection? When we inject contrast media into someone, it increases their blood pressure. It increases the pressure. How? Because of these osmolar changes. That's all you need to know about it. It's a big part of the registry, and I've just tried to make it as simple as I can. Go and listen to that song, too, if you haven't heard already. Um, pharmacodynamics. Nephrotoxicity is the next big one. It's a big fancy word it means hurts your kidneys right nephrotoxicity so again use of the LOCM is going to reduce the risk for this too but anytime we are giving IV contrast to someone anytime and I think this might have been on your quiz I don't know I can't remember if it's not on that quiz it's on your next one get a BUN and creatinine to evaluate their renal function now I'm not going to get down into the weeds of how BUN and creatinine work, but I will say this, chances are we all now have a slightly elevated creatinine. Why? Because a lot of us just ate some brisket. Creatinine is a byproduct of breaking down proteins. So if you go and eat a gigantic steak, the byproduct that's going to be produced by your body of digesting those proteins is creatinine, right? Why do I care if someone ate a gigantic steak? I don't. I don't care if, the, if everyone just ate a gigantic steak, but it does tell me how well their kidneys are functioning. Why? Because the kidneys are tasked with getting rid of creatinine. So if I know the person has an elevated creatinine, I also know their kidneys are working overtime to get rid of that, right? So high creatinine means the kidneys are working hard. High creatinine just means the kidneys are working hard. I don't want the kidneys working hard because I'm about to give them a crap ton of work the minute I inject this IV contrast into them, right? So I want my kidneys nice and easy, not doing that much work, because as soon as I inject that LOCM contrast into them, they're gonna be like, oh my gosh, what did he just do? And try to get rid of all that stuff as quick as they can, excrete it from the system. because it's, it's waste, the body can't use it, it's just gonna get rid of it as quick as it can. If it's already working to get rid of all this other stuff, it's just gonna clog the works. So prior to any injection, any injection at all, get some blood work so we have a baseline. That's my rule, that's the Roberts rule, right? Now there's different facilities that say different things, right? They've got like rules, it's like, oh, it's like a healthy individual, blah, 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 blah. But in most situations, especially trauma situations, it is helpful to have that. So how scary is this nephrotoxicity thing? It means it's killing your kidneys. That sounds scary to me, because if you don't have kidneys, you're not gonna live, right? And it's gonna be a very painful death that probably smells like urine or something, I don't know, horrible, right? So that sounds bad to me, right? But the reality is, is any amount of Coca-Cola causes some amount of renal dysfunction. Any amount of drinking Dr. Pepper causes increase in UTIs, right? Why? 
because of nephrotoxicity. It damages the kidneys. I'm saying this because it was like a week before I got married that we had to struggle with something with like that. Don't drink so much Dr. Pepper. So, um, I used to sit around and drink. I, I, so I drank a Coca-Cola today, so I probably have some nephrotoxicity going on inside my body right now, which is probably the reason I'm talking the way I'm talking right now. <laughs> right? I'm a little hyped up. I, and I, yeah, and I got elevated creatinine and renal dysfunction. This is I am a picture right now of elevated creatinine and renal. No years. I don't drink much Coca Cola. I drink a lot of coffee. Yeah. Okay, what else is uh, Coca Cola got going on for it? It's got increased viscosity, right? It is sticky. It has what we would call fluid friction. So I always think about those really bad motor, motor oil commercials, you know, like decreased viscosity, you know. So we don't want viscosity. We, we don't want this thickness or friction of fluid, right? So if you get some contrast on you, who here has handled contrast? Has anyone had a chance to play with IV contrast? Has anyone gotten some on themselves or on the floor yet? No, but it's really sticky. Yeah. Very, 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 very sticky, right? Every time I think about how sticky it is, I remember a friend of mine who was a cop, he told me they keep Coca-Cola in the back of their cop cars because they use it to clean up blood. Have you ever heard that? That's how sticky it is. Contrast me is the same thing, super sticky, right? Probably didn't want to know that about Coca-Cola, but anything I can do to get people from not drinking Coca-Cola, myself included, yeah. This is my anti-Coca-Cola <laughs> speech. Um, but viscosity is that thickness or friction of the fluid. You can think about it as the stickiness of the fluid. It's the same thing. So anytime we're talking about a fluid, if it's thick and it has high friction, it's also sticky stuff. So think about Coke syrup. Warming contrast media reduces the viscosity. So it is highly recommended that we warm contrast media prior to injection. Typically, we keep it in some kind of warmer already so it's ready for injection. We have to watch that temperature pretty closely because we don't want it to be hot. That'd be a problem, but we do want it warm. Why? To reduce viscosity, right? Um, an example of that would be warm maple syrup, right? Gonna, it's going to pour much more readily than if it was cold. All right, well, what's this ionic stuff? A lot of times we refer to it as non-ionic contrast. We're interested in that ionic versus non-ionic. Ionic just means molecules that dissociate into ions and in solutions. So if they're injected into the bloodstream, they're going to wind up becoming ions. Ions in general are not a good thing to have inside your body because they crash around more. So they could, be, they could be low osmolality contrast media or high osmolality contrast media. It doesn't matter. Um, examples of it are those listed there. Don't worry about memorizing what those examples are because all of them went away in the 1970s, right, with disco. What we all use now is non-ionic, so we don't need to know that molecules do not dissociate in solution. That's what non-ionic means. They stick together. The, they're not cheap pieces of chemistry that fall apart, right? They can be low osmolality or high osmolality. So chances are most of what we work with, 99% of the time with IV contrast, is non-ionic, low osmolality contrast media. But you don't want to go around telling patients that. I'm going to inject you with this non-ionic, low osmolality contrast media. You just say, I'm going to give you some contrast, right? I'm going to put some dye in your veins. I think that's the worst thing you can say, because not only did you say dye, you made them think like that you're going to inject ink into them, which is exactly what you're not doing, right? So I don't think that's a helpful way to talk about it. I just say we need to give you some a, a substance going to allow us to see things more clearly on the x-rays. Examples of this are Ultravist, Omnipeg, Isoview, Visipeg. Of those two, Baptist tends to use Omnipeg. I have most, have most experience with Isoview. And you can weigh them in different weights. They can add different osmolality and stuff like that. But you know, again, you don't need to memorize the examples of it. I don't care what the examples of it are. You'll just see those things out in the clinic and just know that that's what they're talking about. They're using a non-ionic low osmolality contrast media. Clearance. In this case, clearance does not mean like whether or not you can drive a truck underneath something. It means like how long does it take to get rid of this junk? How long does it clear your system? Right? In general, low osmolality contrast media has a half-life of about two hours. So two hours after injection, half of your body has gotten rid of it. In fact, quite a bit of it gets picked up within 10 minutes of injection. It's already being excreted through the urinary system. So um, in patients with normal renal function, clearance is normally about two hours. 
within 24 hours, their body has pretty much completely gotten rid of all the contrast media, right, in patients with good renal function. If they don't have good renal function, if they're in renal failure and they have to have dialysis, guess what? The contrast is there until they go have their next dialysis check-in, right? Okay. Dose is a significant consideration, and oftentimes it's just kind of universalized, except for in pediatric hospitals, and I think that that should not be the case. I think that there's a good case to be made for measuring dosage for every single patient that we do based on their weight and height. But different CT protocols, different x-ray protocols require different doses of iodine, right? Um, and when I say iodine there, I just mean low osmolality contrast media. That's yet another term for it, right? It might just be called iodine. Um, doses often relate to injection rate and the volume and iodine concentration. If we get the doses too high, that's when people start falling off, right? So we want an amount that of a low osmolality contrast media in particular that's sufficient for the exam. We don't want more than that. We don't want uh, less than that. We just want what we need to see what we need to see. Now, I think dose limits are worth considering, but most facilities don't do this, uh, except for pediatric folks. They tie um, contrast dosage to the patient weight, which is what nursing does for dosages of just about everything. So it makes sense that we should adopt the same standards for contrast media administration. We just simply haven't if you were to ask me why, it's because I would say x-ray techs are lazy and they don't do anything except for push buttons all day long, right? Because that's what everyone else thinks. Um, no, I don't know why that's the case. I think it just has to do with management and we need to get better on that because we could wind up saving money if we were more serious about dosage. Um, so two milliliters per kilogram, right? For pediatric dosage, if you wind up working at Le Bonheur or somewhere, just know roughly two milliliters per kilogram is kind of the magic bullet for contrast media. Uh, contrast media uh, dosage. Safety. It is widely used, LOCM is. And so when you're talking to your patients about it, it is widely used and safe, right? There are fatalities related to mechanical injection of contrast agents. It is roughly 0.001%, 0.001%. Have I seen people die from contrast media administration, yes I have, during CT. Um, were those people already in a very compromised place? Yes, they were, right? So they were already having some other struggles and the contrast media gave them just enough boost to get over that edge, right? Um, so it is, a, it is a safety consideration. So as you're handling contrast, be aware, um, if you're gonna be administering contrast, do it under either, uh, it definitely needs to be under doctor's orders, perhaps under direct doctor supervision, at, at minimum under the supervision of, of a technologist, right? You do not need to be injecting contrast yourself, right? Um, because of this small risk here. But in terms of communicating to your patients about, if you're asked to tell the patient, hey, um, will you go tell them we're gonna be doing this IVP or whatever, right? Go out and talk to the patient. We are gonna be giving you IV contrast today. It is, for the most part, safe. We're gonna do everything we can to prevent any harm coming from the injection, right? But anytime we inject, inject people with stuff, there's risks there, right? Anytime we inject anything, risks of allergic reaction and stuff like that. So what are the contraindications? When are the, that, oh, that's just a fancy word for, when do we not wanna do this? Don't wanna do this, contra, against indications. So anytime, we risk contrast-induced nephropathy, right? Uh, that means the patient already has renal impairment, they have an elevated creatinine, and we go to the physician, they say, yeah, the creatinine is too high, we're not gonna use contrast. If they have a history of hyperparathyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, sorry, hyperthyroidism, um, we wanna be careful with it. Uh, if they've are about to have a nuclear medicine thyroid study. Like tomorrow they're scheduled to have a nuclear medicine thyroid study. We do not need to be injecting them with contrast. Why? Because the way a thyroid scan works is they inject you with radioactive iodine and then they look at your thyroid as it's glowing from the radioactive iodine. Well, the problem is, is if I give you a bunch of iodine, right, and then they give you a bunch of iodine, their iodine's not going where they need it to go because my iodine went there. 
right? Pulmonary hypertension, bronchial asthma, congestive heart failure, these are some of the patient conditions that would contraindicate contrast administration. Why? Because I just told you it jacks with your blood pressure. So the person's got already has congestive heart failure, high blood pressure. I don't need to be giving you something that's going to jack with your blood pressure that much more, right? Seizure disorders, actually contrast, um, contrast reactions can cause a seizure to occur. Um, they said that administering Valium can actually reduce that. For my world, why don't we just all get Valium and it would be great, yeah. right? Yeah. If the patient is dehydrated, we want to watch that. They probably need to be hydrated prior to and after. And then do very be very careful about extravasation. Are we familiar with what extravasation means? Okay. It means that the IV was not in the right place, so now I'm injecting contrast into muscle fiber and to soft tissue. It's very painful and it can cause compartment syndrome, especially if it's in the area of a joint where it actually is messed with the bursa or with the joint capsule, right? Um, I have seen extravasation primarily with older patients, right? Why? Because they've got weakened integrity of their blood vessels, right? They've lost some of that elasticity of their blood vessels. Um, and so you have to be careful watch them that much more closely because the blood vessels, blood vessels can actually rupture and cause that. Um, How soon will it show up? Immediately. And there's pain and burning sensation with it, so the patient should communicate with you that it's hurting. Just uh, if I were to ask you what's the big takeaway with this slide, it is helpful to know that this, these are some of the risks and times that we don't want to use IV contrast. But again, and, I'll, and I've said this to you all in the past, I'm going to say it again, get a good patient history anytime you do anything. Get a good patient history and document it. Document, document, document. It's just a good CYA. We all are familiar with that term, right? Plus it's going to help you guide the patient and make sure that the exam is successful, right? Um, additionally, getting a good patient history sets a good rapport with the patient and the patient's more likely to trust you going forward, right? It is really helpful to have the patient's trust because if, if you don't have the patient's trust, especially with like the greatest generation, like people who survived World War II and stuff like that, they just assume everything medical hurts, right? So like for example, this woman that I had one day, she had a contrast ex extravasation in her shoulder, right? Because she brought her arms up, it pinched off the vein. So I was injecting here in the antecubital area, but the, it ruptured up here. And so I'm talking to her. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm feeling the injection go in. It feels fine, right? When I go to do the CT scan, nothing. Where the hell is the contrast? Right? Pardon my French. It's in her freaking shoulder. Why didn't she say something to me? Well, she just assumed that it always hurt like that. Right? So where did I drop the ball? He didn't tell her if you feel pain, he didn't tell her you know. Possibly, yeah. I didn't communicate that to her, so she just assumed it's got to hurt, right? And the opportunity then to communicate to them is when I'm getting that history. Hey, today, what we're doing today, there shouldn't be any pain other than minor discomfort related to the IV placement. Afterwards, you'll feel this stuff going into your arm shouldn't hurt, right? Now, there are different levels of hurt, right? We've all met the people who don't deal with pain well, right? Okay. Yes. I have negative symptoms. Yeah. So, and there's all different kinds of folks, right? I might, not to be too general, but in, for the most part, what I see in the hospital, girls are tougher than guys in general. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, I don't know why that is. <laughs> okay. So the contraindications are different from adverse reactions, right? When I'm talking about adverse reactions, I'm going to break this down by, by each piece. We'll talk about the different reaction types, acute adverse events, how to assess the patient, response to the adverse event, and prevention in the future. So what are the different uh, reaction types? Well, they're subjective reactions. This just means the person felt weird, right? Um, so in general, anytime we give someone IV contrast, they're going to feel hot. They might feel some nausea. They might have a flush feeling. They might taste a metal taste. I had a person say to me once, it tastes like cheap tequila, right? <laughs> a lot of people say, and she said tequila, yeah, right? Oh, I um, thought he said tequila. She did. This was in Texas because they like intentionally mispronounced like, Jeffrey. yeah, stuff, yeah. <laughs> so um, it tastes like a pot, like a penny, like you've had a penny in your mouth, right? And that's a pretty common thing. I had one guy who's an ice fisher, he was like, you should sell this to ice fishermen. 
because they would use it, right? Like to warm themselves up, like it's a pocket warmer or something. Um, an example of an extreme, there's two examples up there of extreme subjective reactions. It just means the person felt weird and they felt this weird, that they're going to projectile vomit all over everything, right? Those patients are out there. They probably already have a level of anxiety that they're masking and that they're able to maintain so much kind of normalcy but then the contrast media is just enough to push them over the edge and they're going to projectile vomit all over everything because they're that anxious, right? Um, so be aware of the patient's anxiety level as much as possible. And again, work to gain their trust. Um, another similar reaction is a vasovagal reaction, which is the fancy th word that we, for, that we use for fainting, right? Vasovagal reaction is just the fancy word for the person fainted, right? Um, so they had a loss of blood pressure to their head and for whatever reason, they just conked out, right? That is a subjective reaction. Why did they faint? I don't know. Something about the occurrence to them felt weird enough that their body responded by them losing consciousness. It was not actually a chemical reaction or a biochemical reaction. It was largely in their mind, is what I'm saying. But it was a severe enough personal response for them that they passed out. That can happen. And the problem with both the puking and the vasovagal stuff is that looks enough like some of the other stuff that's a problem. So chemotoxic is reactions to the actual physiochemical or pharmacokinetic aspects of the contrast. And we've already talked about that. Stuff like contrast-induced nephropathy, which is just a fancy word for nephrotoxicity, right? So that's a pharmacodynamic or a chemotoxic response, right? The ones that we're most concerned with for the most part, the ones that, are, that cause us the most problems and uh, risks are these idiosyncratic ones. Most of these occur within five minutes of administration. We have an incidence of about four to seven percent of the population with low osmolality contrast media. The fancy term for this is that it is an anaphylactoid which is just a fancy way of saying it is allergy-like. It is not allergic. They did not have an allergic reaction. Why can I say it's not allergic, but it's allergy-like? It looks a lot like an allergy reaction. They're going to have all the signs of an allergy reaction, things like hives or urticaria, redness of their skin. They're going to need epinephrine or something like that, uh, antihistamine. The reason I say that it's not an true allergy is I can give them contrast next month and none of that happens, right? But wouldn't, it, yeah. wouldn't you not want to give them contrast the next month? Not necessarily. Gone through that? So nobody can it is a mystery of medicine and I do, no one has direct answers to this, but you're asking good questions. But I don't have an answer, no one has an answer. I read the manual, it's that thick on what exactly anaphylactoid means. So it's, you're saying nobody can be allergic to People are kind of allergic to it, but kind of not, is the most scientific way I can put it. Okay. In general, how do we define allergies? Allergies are you have a response to something, a histamine response to something, where your histamines are actually attacking you. You got stung by the bee, and rather than, than the histamines attacking the bee stuff, it's attacking your stuff, mm -hmm. right? With IV contrast, the histamines are pissed off, and they are attacking you right but the problem is is the next time you get it that might not happen whereas if it's a bee sting the next time it happens you're dead so what right about the whole cya thing if that happened to you the, this month they're not hopefully going to let me do it to you next month just because we don't want to take that chance no that's a legit question um hit pause on that for just a second i will address it you're asking good questions but i want to stress here that they're we're calling them idiosyncratic or anaphylactoid, fancy word for it. It's like allergies, but not really. Mm -hmm. So I caution people away from talking to patients about an allergy re reaction. It is not an allergic reaction. Okay. It is a contrast reaction is the best way to call it. Contrast reaction. Don't use anaphylactoid. They'll think you're crazy. Mm -hmm. And the incidence, when I see 4 to 7%, what does that mean? Every blue moon. Yeah. If you're working in a, in a busy department, that's roughly once in a blue moon, you're going to see something happen. And this can be pretty interesting stuff. It keeps your life interesting. So... 
Um, interestingly enough, when I first started um, working as a CT tech, I became pretty much addicted to gambling. Like every weekend, I would go and gamble. Why? Because it felt like a gamble. Like you don't, you know, once in a blue moon, you're going to hit jackpot, and this person's going to, you know, need this crazy. The, the crash cart's got to be wheeled in there and stuff, and the risk was up there, right? So acute adverse events, incidents. The majority of them are mild. The majority of them are mild. What are the risk factors? Well, like an allergy, a previous contrast media reaction does increase per person's risk by about 50%, but not 100%, and the response is not gonna be worse than the initial response. It's gonna be probably pretty much the same terrible response that they had before. With true allergies, the response the second time would be worse, right? Um, if a person has asthma, that's a risk factor. If a person is like the boy in the bubble and they have a lot of allergies, that's kind of a risk factor, right? There's already stuff that's going on with their histamines that are kind of jacked up. And if they're on certain drugs, that's a risk factor, right? The big one uh, that we look for constantly is uh, metformin, although that mostly has to do with kidneys, not necessarily the idiosyncratic stuff. All right, how are we assessing the patients? Well, again, we're keeping that steady conversation with them the whole time that we're doing any injection. How are you doing? You feel okay? I need you to respond and actually say things to me. Let's talk about the weather, right? Why? I'm not that interested in the weather, and neither are they. But I need to see, are they still able to communicate verbally? Because if they're having a contrast reaction, they may not be able to communicate anymore, right? So that would be a significant sign. But signs that we look for regularly are highs, sometimes called urticaria. It's the same thing, just a different name for the same thing. Diffuse erythema, which means redness of the skin. Bronchospasm, which means it feels like they um, are having a hard time breathing, can't catch my breath. That's a problem, right? I feel like someone's strangling me, right? That's another thing. We call that laryngeal edema, right? Now, I do not go into the patient's room while I'm doing the injection and let them know, okay, now if you experience hives, or redness of your skin, or you feel like someone's strangling you, or you can't catch your breath, then please let me know. Why? Because I just tipped off all the hypochondriacs, right? Now they know what I'm looking for, right? Oh my gosh, my the strangling, oh, look at me, I'm important, <laughs> right? Don't tell them what you're looking for, just keep the conversation going, okay? Hypotension, their blood pressure bottoms out, right? Now I can't just look at someone and tell that their blood pressure bottomed out. I wish I had that x-ray vision and I don't, right? So anytime we're doing IV contrast, if I'm looking for this kind of stuff, not only do I need to be able to keep communication open with my patient, chances are I want to have a blood pressure before I even get started. But nine times out of 10, when I've seen people doing IV injections, they're not getting a baseline blood pressure. Well, why not, right? Why don't I at least know what baseline is for this person? In fact, I used to do blood pressures on every single person I ever gave contrast, and I actually wind up flagging people that had high blood pressure who did not need contrast at all, because their blood pressure was already high. So a good idea to get a blood pressure before you even get started, because then you can tell if they actually are uh, losing their blood pressure Unresponsive, pulseless, that sounds scary, right? Um, pulmonary edema, seizures and convulsions, hypoglycemia, blood, blood sugar drops off, anxiety, and then some kind of rebound, which means they come back around like, <laughs> what just happened, right? That's the good thing, actually, that part. All right, <laughs> and the severity can be risked by mild, moderate, and severe, but these are so not right, because like mild like includes like laryngeal edema, right? Which feels like someone's strangling you, and if that's the mild, then like, what's the hot sauce here, right? It's like severe is like, includes death. And I don't know, I think death should be a separate category from severe. It's like, at, at that point, it's not severe. It's like, this is just not even a good situation. All right, how do we respond to this stuff, besides, you know, running around with our pants on fire? Um, preserve the IV access. The number one thing that you can do is make sure that their IV is still in them. Don't yank their IV out. It seems like a no-brainer, but people do weird stuff when they're under stress, right? Don't remove the patient's IV. The IV wasn't the problem. The problem was what you went through the IV, and the solution will also go through the IV, right? Um, monitor their vitals. Again, if I already had them hooked up to the pulse oximeter, I knew what their blood pressure was, I saw that their blood pressure bottomed out, I'm doing my job. I already had them wired up. And so step two is already done. Step one, I didn't even have to worry about, right? I'm already responding correctly. I have them hooked up to a pulse oximeter. Wow, win three for Ben, right? Alert the physician or the nurse, which generally requires calling a code, 
right? So this is not a time to be nice and polite, right? Um, I know that at Baptist facilities, you're not supposed to cuss or use profane <laughs> language, right? It's in the policy. But if I'm coding on your CT table, I don't mind if you use every F word in the Bible, right? Get people into that room to save my Baptist butt, right? <laughs> That's all I'll say about that. It's not a time to be polite. Don't be like, oh my gosh, should I call a code? Oh this is God. this is so confusing. And I'm it's like, does Johnny still like me? <laughs> no, that's not that moment. It's like call the freaking code, alert the physician and the nurse, and get on with it. All right. Um, get them on some O2. I know that the physician has to be there to do these next three things. So you're not expected to do this stuff. Just know this is where they're coming from and this is what they're gonna be doing. So if I know they're gonna give them O2, I've got the O2 ready to give to them. Right, if I know they're going to need suction, I got my suction ready for them. If I, if I know they need Benadryl and epinephrine and fluids, it's already there in my crash cart. I've already got the crash cart in the room. Right? So I just grab the stuff, I let them tear the parts, parts off and yell stuff and like, CC and blah, 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 and live it like they're in a TV show, right? You're right. They all love that. You know they do. It's like, we're like in TV, we're like saving this person. All right. Document. This is where you can earn your money. Because chances are they're all trying to be on TV and say CC really loud at each other, but no one's writing the crap down. So you can be the person that's there writing it down at 0800 hours administered epinephrine. At 0805, we got another blood pressure. Blood pressure's rising, right? And then uh, evaluate after the end. There's probably going to need to be some kind of documentation done as well. Prevention. How do we avoid this? I mean, it sounds like fun. Everyone comes over to your house and plays with you for a little while, right? And they go on and, you know, the epinephrine needles are all over the place and stuff. And it's like a good day in the park, right? But we want to avoid it for our patient's sake. It's not for our own. And so the very first thing we can do is use low osmolality contrast media, right? Use LOCM, which we're already doing. Premedicate the patient. So this answers Ms. Thorne's question. If the person, if I find out in the course of talking to this individual, that they've had any kind of reaction to contrast, even if it was subjective. They gave it to me and I passed out because his eyes were so blue, right? They had that subjective response or whatever. I will still premedicate that person, right? Why? Because prednisone makes people happy, right? I wish I could get some Valium into them as well because it's gonna make everything better for everyone, right? So if they've had a reaction in the past, premedicate the heck out of them, yes? I wanna take a vote. Let's say that Ben has a cook before everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, the, this is an area that's near and dear to my heart as well. Right? Document, and you realize this is one of the first times I've talked to y'all about actual patient care stuff. Everything else has been like, stuff happens inside of a tube and maybe this is interesting. All right. Um, document, document, document. This is something you can all be doing right now, practicing your hand at, what are the perfect ways to document, talk to your nursing student friends, figure out how they do their documentation, because they've got documentation down, right? Um, and I don't remember all the little mnemonics that they use, but they really know how to cut to the quick. Because you'll get these people, in terms of getting patient history, that's what that means, PPD, HX, patient history, um, is some people are poor historians, right? That does not mean that it's like watching something on PBS, right? Well, then the wagon came down, and it's not like that. Like it, it means that they misrepresent and misreport stuff, or they're so long-winded and tangential in their response, you've lost what the heck you just asked them, right? So learn some of those soft skills of when to cut someone off look i really just need to know whether or not you have hyperparathyroidism not what's going on in your son's life and how you think i'd be a nice like fit for him like so learn how to like cut to the chase in terms of what the person's telling you um refer back to the form constantly make the notes that are necessary and weed through what's important and what's not and that just comes with time that just comes with time but chances are at this point in the program, chances are there's at least two or three of us, maybe more, in this room who have done the wrong exam. Chances are. And it's not your fault, right? Necessarily. But a patient came in, they needed this, right? That's what the physician order says is this. So I did the physician order, but they really didn't need that. They needed this, right? 
So I'm not saying that you are the person who needs to figure that out, but you are the person who needs to figure that out, kind of. It is part of your job to get good history from the patient. Well, why are we doing this exam? Yeah. And it feels good when you catch them. <laughs> and it is kind of, I'll say that, it's also kind of training. If you're interested in going into CT or MRI, one of the best things you can do right now as an x-ray tech is start getting better patient history. Because it is a big part of how CT and MRI work. All right, I'm switching gears a whole lot, right? And I'm going to talk about barium sulfate. So we're not injecting this people into people's veins. That would be crazy, right? I'm talking about stuff that we give people to drink now or that we possibly inject into their bum, right? But, yeah, I'm not talking about IV. Never put IV barium through IV. It would be very difficult to do that. You'd have to be like Dr. Death to figure out how to do that, right? But... Um, Anaphylactoid reactions to barium are very uncommon. That sentence is false. I need to correct that. Because they are not anaphylactoid with barium. Some people are allergic to barium. It is not allergy-like. They are allergic to barium. So it should say anaphylactic right? responses to barium are very uncommon. It's roughly one in 750,000 exams, which means in my 15 years of doing CT and with all the barium I gave people, I never saw a single reaction to barium that I know for sure was, a con was an actual allergic reaction. The severe reaction, so that would just be a mild one that's severe, that should misspelled, but one in, I did not say that, I said that is misspelled, but one in 2.5 million exams, that's like no one ever has a severe reaction to barium, which is good news because, and also too, they drank it that didn't get injected into their body. So if they're going to have a reaction to it and it's severe, chances are you'd rather have drank in it, right? Because then you just puke it up and hopefully the reaction will stop. Sorry to be crass. Prep times generally for barium are one to four hours, depending on which way it's going. And by which way I mean whether we're drinking it or whether we're doing a rectal contrast administration. Um, every 30 minutes drink uh, a half the bottle, scan after two hours. That's the CT way of doing things. Um, don't worry about that example, but that's just an example of a kind of prep that a patient might need to be given. You'll be given instructions on how to instruct the patients. But just understand barium is still a medicine. Even though the responses are super rare, it'll still need to be pulled out of the like medicine cabinet or whatever and documented that it was given to the right patient at the right time and everything. Contraindications. Times we do not want to give barium. Well, obviously, if the person's had a previous allergic reaction to barium, we want to note that. Um, if they're obstructed, we don't want to give them barium. Why? Because barium will just make them that much more obstructed. They'll actually harden like into concrete in their intestines and it would be very painful, right, to get rid of that. Um, perforation. If there is a tear anywhere in their intestines, we do not want to give them barium. Why? Because it would then leak out into their peritoneum and cause infection within the peritoneal cavity. That's a problem, right? That's the number one contraindication for barium is suspected perforation. Don't give them barium. Uh, tracheoesophageal fistula just means there's a communication between the esophagus and the fish and, and the trachea. Uh, yeah. Um, so that if they swallow something through the esophagus, it could drain into the trachea. What's the problem with that? They've just inhaled barium into their lungs, and now we've got barium pneumonia, which it would be. Y'all, has anyone tasted barium? Has anyone? felt how heavy the bottle is. Yeah. It's like you could use it as a lift, like a weight, right? If that's how heavy this stuff is, and it has a high atomic number, imagine how hard it's going to be to cough that junk out of your lungs. It ain't going anywhere, right? Yeah. The doctor said aspirating, though. Yes, it yes, it'd be the same thing. Oh. It'd be like an aspiration pneumonia. This is one just caused by a uh, fistula. It's the same thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, different route, but same thing. Uh, so avoid aspiration of it. Avoid if you're if you're if you're facilitating a patient drinking barium, do everything you can to help them drink it right in a way that they're not going to choke. Does that make sense? Um, pyloric stenosis um, just means that there's a stricture in the stomach, right? The barium would have a hard time getting past that stricture um, or known hypersensitivity, like we already said. 
Okay, we're almost done. Adverse reactions, the most common one is diarrhea. Plus it goes in white, it's gonna come out white. So get prepared for like the ghost diarrhea from hell. Like that's what you can tell all your patients, right? Because some people, it's really gonna do just that. Um, abdominal cramping, right? That's a little bit more rare, but occasionally people say that it just makes them feel terrible and bloated and stuff in their, in their guts. Um, impaction, that's pretty rare unless there's already a stenosis or there's already some stricture or obstruction in the bowel, but um, it can cause impaction. Uh, you can have a barium appendicitis, which means that the barium actually formed what's called a fecolith inside of the appendix, and now we've got basically barium infected poop inside of the appendix, for lack of a better term. Um, so appendicitis caused by the barium itself. Intestinal perforation, of course, we, don't, we want to avoid that um, for the reasons we already said, and then peritonitis. But in general, I just tell people, look, it goes in white, comes out white, please drink more water. I did not say drink more beer or wine. I said drink more water, not more coffee. I said drink more water because the water is going to help you get rid of this stuff. Living in Austin, you had to be really clear about what kind of water you're talking about. I'm not talking about the water that's found in beer, right, or the water that's found in tequila or tequila. Um, water-soluble contrast. This is not water. It is water-soluble contrast. So things like gastrographin and Omnipake, sometimes we mix up this amazing cocktail that's got uh, contrast in it that's diluted in water or crystal light or apple juice, water-based stuff, right? Um, in general, it's about 2% to 5% of the LOC mixed up in water, right? So it's different from barium. It can be absorbed very rapidly by the intestine since it's water-based. We want to avoid those dehydrated patients, so we want the patients dehydrated already so it's not, they're not just sucking the water out of it. We do this because it has reduced risks, especially for kids. So babies, we don't, in general, give them barium. Why? Because I just said all that stuff about it going into their lungs. And babies love to do weird stuff when they're trying to eat things, right? <laughs> like I was out to eat with my niece and nephew last night, and I was like, oh my goodness, like, like I know you're one years old or whatever, but don't do everything that you just did for the last five minutes, you know? Especially what you're doing right now with that corn chip. Um, but um, it does offer that reduced risk of doing bad stuff with it for babies. Now let's talk about water. So I have a picture here of water to remind me to tell you this is a negative contrast agent. So I am not talking about water soluble. I'm talking about water, AKA H2O, right? AKA not water soluble water, right? Um, the problem with using water as a contrast, it's fine that it's negative, that whatever, that's fine. The problem with it is, is it's difficult to fully distend the bowel. So that abdominal cramping that the patient was complaining about, that actually makes me happy because I know the barium's doing what I want it to do, which is distend their bowels, which causes cramps, right? So the patient comes in complaining of uh, abdominal cramping, great, let's get this exam underway. I know the barium's doing what it's supposed to be doing. I know that sounds mean, but with water, you're not going to have that, right? Because the way the digestive system works is it gets into the large intestine, it sucks all that water out, right? And it likes the water. So the water gets put into other systems and not where I want it in the digestive system. Finally, in terms of negative contrast agents, air, like I've already mentioned, and CO2. We often use negative contrast on x-ray images of the GI tract, right? Um, we may have to give the patient some kind of antispasmodic drug <coughs> to improve bowel distension because when we start pumping the air into their large intestine, that makes the bowel spasm. And if the bowels are spasming, then we've got motion on the x-ray, right? Um, yeah. But has anyone had a chance to do a double contrast con uh, barium enema or something like that? Great. So. Very often, if we're doing any kind of barium enema, the better term for it is a dual contrast study. Why? Because we're giving them barium, generally, through an enema in their rectum, plus we're giving them air through the same enema in their rectum. Why? 
we want the barium to coat the intestines, we want the air to distend it, right? And between the two of them, we'll be able to see the polyp or cancer, whatever we're looking for in there, okay? All right, that was all I've got for you. Any questions about that?